Are you out of your mind? Here's the debate. You're upset. They're saying we believe you. This is it? I thought that. Uh, Gentlemen, we're live. Fantastic. Okay, folks, episode number 151 with Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort, if you don't know the name, uh, probably in 2016, you couldn't have turned on the TV, newspaper, magazine, uh, uh, anything. If you turn on social media, you would have seen his face all over the place, nonstop. Uh, and there was uh, many different reasons for that. We'll talk about many of the reasons today. We kind of want to hear from uh, himself as well. Background, uh, party campaign consultant, chaired the Trump presidential campaign from June to August of 2016. He served as an advisor for presidential campaigns of Republicans Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Bob Dole. And on top of that, in 1980, he co-founded the Washington, D.C.-based lobbying firm Black, Manfort, and Stone, along with principals Charles R. Black and Roger Stone, joined by Peter G. Kelly in 1984. So we got a lot of stuff to cover. With that being said, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Good to be here. And if I if I uh, uh, ask you correctly, this is the first time you're doing a long form like this. You've not yeah. done a two-hour one. Not yet. It's going to feel like five minutes. So uh, uh, it, for, for the audience that doesn't know, because you've been away from it for a few years, meaning not that you've been away from it, you've not been, the, the controversy has not been at its peak the last 12, 24, 36 months. But if people that know your name, the average person that knows your name, if they're from the Republican side, they think you were framed. They think they uh, put you in jail. They think they came after you simply because you were associating with Trump. And they think that that Durham investigation that came out saying the fact that Hillary Clinton's dossier was all fake targeting, trying to get you guys to not get reelected, a form of revenge. On the other side, if you watch SNL, if you watch Rachel Maddow, Anderson Cooper, Don Lamont, any of these other guys, they would say you had a, a, a connection to Russia and Putin and collusion and Trump and all of that. And all that's true. And that's actually not why you went away. But for the audience that doesn't know, maybe share with us a little bit about your background and how it came to the controversies in 2016. Sure. I, uh, I guess I'd start with I went to uh, Georgetown University, graduated from the Law Center there as well. Uh, practiced law for a few years, but then uh, you know, got always was interested in politics. Uh, got involved uh, in Republican politics very young. Uh, my father was mayor of my hometown. Uh, it was a blue collar town, very democratic town. He was a Republican, uh, first one in his family. Uh, became a Republican because he disagreed with what FDR did in Yalta. Uh, my father fought in the World War II and was in sense that. Uh, that uh, Roosevelt gave away uh, Central Central Europe and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, for the, and thought we fought for those freedoms. Why could he just? How could he just give that to uh, a communist country? Uh, that was impactful on him, and in talking to him as I was growing up, it became impactful on me. Uh, first campaigns I got really involved in were uh, when I was at Georgetown. I got involved with Nixon's reelection campaign, uh, and then. Uh, Ford's campaign then began to be actively involved at the national level, really in Ford's campaign. Uh, served as part of the team that uh, that ran it, uh, working with uh, Jim Baker, who was his first campaign. Uh, but he and I became very good friends during that campaign. Powerful man. Uh, he's a good man. Yeah. He's a very good man. And uh, I talk about in the book, I talk some of uh, uh, the stories about those early years when he was learning. Uh, uh, the chief of staff for Jerry Ford was mm -hmm. a uh, very... Uh, green behind the ears uh, you know, policy wonk guy named uh, Dick Cheney. Uh, and so uh, really early on in my career with that campaign, I got to know a number of people personally and uh, that who be became figures in the Republican Party for the next 40 years. Uh, during the, uh, you know, after uh, the, the 70, uh, 76 campaign, got involved in Governor Reagan's campaign for president, again, was part of the senior team. And uh, after he was elected, uh, uh, Roger Stone, Charlie Black, and I started a political consulting firm, which really became a lobbying firm, a government affairs firm as well. Uh, and that really began to change the model. In, in the, uh, you know, before 1980, most of the government affairs work was done by law firms. And people were hired, uh, law firms were hired to deal with specific issues that may be legislative issues or regulatory issues. 
uh, and we decided to create a different model. We were interested in international affairs. We were interested in uh, in uh, government affairs, and so we thought it was a natural as grassroots politics was just beginning and we were on the cutting edge of some of that to bring some of the campaign skills into uh, uh, into Washington government affairs. And the only Republican firm at that time was a company called Timmons and Company. Bill Timmons was the legislative director for uh, for Nixon in, in the White House. But he had a very different model. His model was to have a, uh, 10 or 12 uh, corporate clients and uh, and to only represent that that group, we saw ourselves as having a much different concept, uh, and uh, and the firm grew, became probably one of the most powerful firms in the Washington scene during the uh, Reagan and Bush years. Um, during that time, we expanded our work beyond just corporate five hundred work to include a number of countries, represented a number of countries. Always, I should add, uh, with U.S. foreign policy interests at, at heart, and always in concert with the White House, notwithstanding what uh, Rachel Maddow and people like that have said over the last few years. And in fact, if you look at our, our clients, you will see that we were always involved on, in areas where the foreign policy issues were the uh, were the issues uh, affecting those countries. For example, in Angola, uh, we represented Jonas Savimbi, uh, who was a freedom fighter uh, for UNITA and active in, uh, in dealing with... Uh, uh, you know, trying to end the Cuban con- concentrated and Soviet uh, dominated Angola government, um, and uh, we suddenly got involved in the Congo, got involved in uh, Guinea, and had a big African practice uh, working with Reagan foreign policy and Bush foreign policy uh, ob- objectives in Africa. Again, in the course of the last five years, a lot of this has been distorted, and we'll talk about this some, I'm sure, today. It's in my book as well, um, where the uh, woke left, for want of a better term, uh, decided that they were just going to declare that I was (laughs) pro-Russian, pro-Putin, and uh, uh, never with any facts. I mean, because I represented an oligarch, uh, in Russia, that became tantamount to anything and everything for my whole career. And uh, and he was an oligarch that we were not doing things in Russia on. Um, although he was concerned with bringing some changes to Russia as well. Uh, and I get into that in the book. So I mean, over the course of, uh, of the last 20 years, I got involved in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, I thought it was, Ukraine was a very important country. Uh, the Soviet, well, the Russians were trying to uh, to f- force Ukraine to not become part of Europe. I thought Ukraine should be a part of Europe. Uh, I elected a government that uh, was from Eastern Ukraine. It was, you thought Ukraine should be part of Europe? Absolutely, one hundred percent. And in fact, my whole time there, and this is all. But public. your client didn't want that, though. No, that's not true. That's not true. And, and in fact, if you look at his his presidency, uh, you will see that. The, ch- ch- the changes that were made in Ukraine yeah. uh, over those three and a half years of his presidency, we changed the economic system, the legal system, and the uh, uh, the regulatory system, working with the European Union directly. And I was working with the European Union directly. Like, Are I you was, talking about Yanukovych at yeah. the time? Yeah, talking about okay. Yanukovych. Yeah. And this, this has this been is part 14, of the— 13, 14? What, the, what well, this is, he was elected president in 2010. Right. And immediately, the first thing he did was go to Brussels— and commit himself to working with Brussels to become part of Ukraine. When historically, all previous new incoming presidents went to Moscow first. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very controversial, very controversial not going to Moscow. He understood what he was doing. He understood the symbolism of it. And so did the Europeans, and so did the Americans. And they started working with him. Um, and and the... If you look at, and this is all public information, but it's not convenient facts. If you look at what he did during those three and a half years, he prepared Ukraine to become part of Europe. He even said that while he wasn't committed to make Ukraine part of NATO yet because that was too controversial of a decision inside inside Ukraine, he, he left that question open. And it was only when uh, Putin realized that the negotiations for the trade agreement, which was the predecessor for the, associ- the political association agreement, was about to be signed, that Putin threatened Yanukovych publicly. Again, this is all public information. 
had said to, to said to Yanukovych that if you sign this trade agreement, I will immediately shut down all trade with Ukraine, which was approximately 70% of Ukraine's trade. And the trade agreement that we had negotiated with... Uh, Putin said that publicly? Oh, yeah. And threatened. Because the decision was made sudden. There's celebration. Everyone's outside. Kids are waiting. College students are waiting. They're about to go out there and party hard. You know the scene. You've seen it. And all of a sudden, boom, Well, we're not going to do it. But, right the, but there's a lot more to the story. And that, like, that's all, again, public information. Uh, yeah, when, when Putin made that threat mm-hmm. publicly, because he wanted Ukraine to be part of a trade association that he was creating, he, Putin, you know, he said no. Um, and Yanukovych said, we actually asked uh, Borosa, the president of the European Union, uh, for a, a a subsidy to help Ukraine bridge the time frame when it was becoming going to be, sign the association agreement because the way this document read, if you look at it, the the all the advantages in the first three to four years were favorable to European companies because Ukraine was basically taking down its barriers and, and its trade uh, its trade barriers and its in its own uh, tariffs uh, and and allowing it to be a free trade. Uh, part of a free sure. trade association. Yeah. And if you, Russia was going to shut 70% of their trade down, of the country down, all of its trade with with Ukraine, but 70% of the, of the foreign trade, Ukraine were, couldn't have survived that. And so it needed the subsidy. The Europeans said no. Uh, and Yanukovych then said, look, I can't sign this and have my country shut down if you're not willing to help me, but I'm not saying I'm not going to sign it. I've got to work out this problem because two, you know, a week before, whatever it was when he made this final statement, Ukraine, Ukraine learned that it was going to have its market shut down. That's when everything fell apart. That's when everything exploded. Did he, did he share that with his people? This is, this is public information. But what, what, but what I'm trying to say is in that moment when he said, I can't, did he share that with his people that 70% of our commerce that goes through Russia we're going to lose? This was all public. Yes, absolutely, 100%. That, that same day. That's, in, that's in, you go back and you look uh, at the international news. You look at what Putin threatened. You look at the Ukrainian news of the impact of what that would be. You look at what was being said to the uh, to the European uh, Union members. It was. This is all public information. So let me ask you, what's your opinion on uh, Putin on the way he threatened? So in that situation, say it's 2013, and Yankovic is sitting there, and he's kind of like, uh, I'm not saying his name correctly. Yanukovych, Yanukovych, Yanukovych is sitting there, and he's saying, <clears throat> hey, listen, I'd love to do this and join you, but if I do, our number one guy that's doing business with us, we're going to lose 70%. In that moment when Putin was bullying Yanukovych, what was your opinion about Putin in that moment? Well, my opinion of Putin has always been the same, going before that moment, after that moment. He's a thug. What you're seeing today in Ukraine was what those who were paying attention to Ukraine 20 years ago saw. You Putin, saw the writing on the wall with Putin 100%. 20 years ago that you like did you are you saying that you kind of predicted what's happening today? I, I what I'm saying yes. I mean can I predict that uh, that the you know, rubble that's happened? No. I would never have thought that Putin would have leveled the country. But mm-hmm. did I was I aware was uh, or was anybody aware of Putin's desire for Ukraine? Yes, Putin always felt. And again, we in the in the West, things are right out there, and the, you know, that we don't pay attention to because we don't want them to be uh, true. But Putin has always said he thought Ukraine should never have been you know, given its independence by Khrushchev mm-hmm. and Khrushchev. I mean, the story on on Ukraine's independence it was part of the Soviet Union, but it was an, an integral part of Greater Russia. Hmm. Khrushchev, when he was uh, the general secretary in the 50s, was from Ukraine. He was Ukrainian. And so as a gift on their independence day, he gave them their independence, uh, never thinking that the Soviet Union was going to collapse, never thinking that it made – it was a distinction without yeah. a difference. Um, and, you know, Putin was totally against that. I mean, I, he wasn't involved back then, but he thought that was one of the two biggest mistakes in the history of the Soviet Union, the other being Gorbachev's uh, wor- working with, with Reagan and, uh, and Bush to break up the Soviet Union. So – he has always been an historical Ukraine is part of Russia, not Ukraine is is an independent country with uh, Russian heritage. Have you ever met Putin? No. Never. No. Um, and so, so what Putin was doing with putting the squeeze on was because he finally realized Yanukovych was serious. Even though, mind you, 
changing the legal structure, changing the economic structure, changing the regulatory structure, it's a massive amount of work. And Ukraine went through that for the first three years of Yanukovych's presidency in great detail, working with the European Union. Uh, they, they call it the, the Committee on Enlargement, uh, which is the body that de- from the EC that deals with potential new countries. Mm-hmm. And I personally was working with Stefan Rupfelet, who was the commissioner of the, of the Commission of Enlar- for Enlargement. And we worked through thousands of issues, uh, all towards the end of getting the trade agreement signed, and then to, and getting the uh, uh, the political, it's called the association agreement signed. That was the key work during Yanukovych's time. Where things went badly for Yanukovych with the West was about a year and a half in when he had his opponent, former Prime Minister Timoshenko, arrested. Uh, and he had her arrested for corruption. Corruption which her president, when she was Prime Minister, uh, Viktor Yushchenko was president Victor Yushchenko accused Timoshenko of the same corruption. But it was part of his base, so he couldn't go after mm-hmm. her. In, later in life, he did. He was very public about how she uh, uh, she committed cr- uh, uh, crimes in dealing with Ukrainian interest on, on Russian gas uh, coming to the country. But when Yanukovych you know, had her arrested, the West went crazy uh, because she was the darling of Albright, the darling of Clinton, uh, even though she was a corrupt prime minister, it was if you were for people that don't know, she would be the modern AOC. Would you put her like that? Who? How would you say her personality? How she was? Well, I, I no, I wouldn't call her AOC. I mean, the the, the uh, she was a typical Soviet politician, hmm. uh, but she was good looking. She understood how to work the media. Tyler Polaro. And uh, and she uh, she sold herself to Merkel and Albright and Clinton um, as the hope of the West. The reality was she was the Putin candidate again in 2010. Yanukovych wasn't. Again, in the, one of the, the major misnomers, they didn't want Yanukovych. Uh, yeah, they and the reason they wanted her is because the corruption that she committed, that she was arrested for, was when she went to Russia. To negotiate the the agreement with the between Russia and U- and Ukraine for the gas pipeline, the, what happens until the Nord Stream pipeline with Germany, all of the Russian gas to Europe came through a pipeline through Ukraine. It was very important to Ukraine's uh, economic lifeblood. Hmm. And uh, this is her. Uh, yeah, but it's her before she changed her hairstyle. <laughs> uh, Can I ask you a very? But, 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 but let me oh, let yeah, me sorry. say one thing here, and then I'm, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna go to you. You know what's tough for me, for, for the average person who's not on the inside to believe this, is if Yanukovych was against Putin and Putin wasn't happy about Yanukovych, then why did he a few months later, when he was in exile, come and protect him and bring him to Russia to provide safety to him? That's yeah. very... No, I agree with that. That's, I was opposed to Yanukovych. You know, there was a... a, a you, some people call it a coup. Some people call it a revolution that uh, was geared towards Yanukovych that probably was not not indigenously grown by itself. Uh, let me leave it at that for now. But I mean, uh, I'm from Iran. OK, so I remember when I'm a revolution baby, October of 1978. Right. So three months after that, the Shah's in exile. Right. And Khomeini's in France. He comes from uh, uh, France to Iran, and he was in exile for 15 years. I think he was in exile twice, Khomeini, when they eventually was hiding in France. But it's kind of like Iraq to come and say, hey, Shah, come and stay here in Iraq and we'll give you protection. It's very weird for you to say that he's not against Putin, but Putin provides that protection. Yeah, because Putin saw the destabilizing effect. Again, you, you have to understand something else about Ukraine, and which Putin is learning now. Uh, Eastern Ukraine is Ukraine's two countries. You know, there's Eastern Ukraine, which is a Russian ethnic right. base, and there's Western Ukraine, which is uh, is more European, Hungarian, mm-hmm. Polish. Um, and Yanukovych was very popular in Eastern Ukraine, even near the end of the, his time. Why? Because he was protecting Russian culture, Russian heritage, Russian language, but not joining Russia. 
and 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 what Putin didn't understand when he invaded Ukraine and expected everybody to be running to the streets in the east to they see him as the conquering hero was that the Ukrainian people of Russian ethnicity uh, do cherish their freedom, their, their their history, their language, their their religion. There's a big part of the fight in Ukraine is is the Orthodox Russian uh, Orthodox versus Ukrainian Orthodox religion. It's very political, but and the Eastern Ukrainian Ukrainians are Russian Orthodox uh, Christians, um, but they treasure all of that. And Yanukovych was their protector. But what they treasure just as much, if not more, is their freedom. And Eastern Ukrainians, I did over 150 polls in Ukraine. I understand the, the whole country very well. I had, uh, in all of my polls, was, you know, I would be testing to, to understand the, the dynamics and the, uh, between the, the conflicts in the country and, of course, the Russian, the Eastern versus Western part of Ukraine conflicts. No poll. Were those were, were any of the Russian ethnic Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine ever more than four percent saying they wanted to be part of Russia and not part of Ukraine? Hmm. They cherished their Ukrainian freedom because they knew the difference between freedom under Soviet slash Russia versus what they had in Ukraine, um, and so there was no desire to become part of that. And Putin is seeing that now. In its ugliest uh, uh, manifestations, with the uh, the people fighting, you know, you know, they've got a citizen militia that's that's defeating the Russian army right now, and and it's just as strong in the eastern part as it was uh, as it is in the western part of the country. Yanukovych was a hero to them. Putin to the eastern, to the well, to yes, Prince, sure. to, definitely to the eastern, which yeah. was his base, but also <laughs> not to the elites. Um, in the West, but to the elites in the East. And the, another ugly secret that uh, people don't like to talk about is some of the biggest promoters. You can begin also, let me back up one second, the economics of Ukraine. The West, East is, is where the wealth of Ukraine was because that's where the industry is. That's where the uh, yeah, the gas is. And, and, and the West part of Ukraine is the breadbasket, which is an important part, but it's it's not the engine of the Ukrainian economy. The oligarchs in the eastern part, which are most were most of the important oligarchs in my time there, they saw the importance of going becoming part of Europe, not staying a part of Russia. And it's it, again, if you think about it, it's logical. They were sort of the the bastard child uh, with with the oligarchs of Russia. Uh, they didn't have the power. They didn't have the political support. They didn't have any of that, and so and and they were always at risk to the Russian model, and which was also the Ukrainian model of how you of business and who owns a business. And in those times, and in Russia still, it's you have the power, you have the business. So if you have a change in leadership, the new leadership they don't try and buy up your interest. They come to you and they say, "Here's the shares. Sign them over to me." It's it's a corrupt, you know, system, and the Eastern Ukrainian oligarchs saw the protection of the West in their of their business interest if they were part of a real market economy and were part of a, a real democratic framework uh, political system, which being part of Europe would have been for Ukraine. So they were in the fort, and th this was the base, the economic base of Yanukovych's support as well. So Yanukovych. One of the first things that I talked to him about before I agreed to uh, to help him was his commitment to becoming part of Europe. To him, he saw the value of being an, uh, an independent president of a free Ukraine that was going to be the biggest country in Europe. Uh, uh, and lots of natural resources. Lots of uh, 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 Ukraine the, offers a lot to the world. Absolutely, yeah. and and so he. But they, saw, have, but they have a lot of controversy. They go back the lineage with uh, Nazi with Hitler. There's their well, history is not the most. Well, that's the western part of, right. the, of Ukraine, not the eastern mm -hmm. part. Um, but and, and, but again, from Yanukovych's standpoint, yeah. and that I mean, frankly, he would say that at times. Why do you overlook the blemishes in the my, of my eastern Ukra of western Ukrainian uh, opponents? And, and uh, over exaggerate the blemishes on the Eastern Ukrainians. I mean, there's too much to go, go what into. What do you think about Zelensky? What do you think about how Zelensky is handling everything? Uh, the last he's he's been brilliant. I mean, I mean, uh, Zelensky was an actor mm -hmm. uh, who 
played the role of president on a popular television program, yeah. and people would joke to him and say, you ought to be run for president. I mean, he's, all these other guys are doing a terrible job. Uh-huh. And he did, and he won. And yeah, I never expected this out of him, but he's risen to the moment. He understands his symbolic importance to democracy, to Ukraine, and he's been brilliant. And uh, and You ever uh, met him? Uh, once, but not in an important way. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and... and uh, and like Ronald Reagan, and really like Donald Trump, he understood how you use the media to promote, and and what he's doing. You know, one of the criticisms I always had about the West is their sort of you know, superficial support for Ukraine being a part of Europe. There's a lot of history as to why they didn't want Ukraine to be a part of Europe, but they could never say that. Um, and you look at the support that the Eastern Euro- that East Western Europe was giving to Ukraine until it became unconscionable not to give it lethal aid, mm-hmm. and uh, and you, you see exactly what I'm talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. But what Zelensky has done is he recognizes the the sort of uh, duplicity of the leadership of Europe, and so he, he's speaking to these legislatures. The brilliant part of that movie is not that he's speaking to the politicians. He's speaking to the people in those countries that those legislatures mm-hmm. represent. And he's forcing those legislatures to actually give him the lethal aid that he needs because he's creating a political you know, groundswell yeah. in their countries. That's his brilliance. And he He's th- also calling on artists to create the groundswell right. that you're talking and, about. To- because he understands that... The European political community and the Washington political community, by the mm-hmm. way, is is not. You know, there were a lot of reasons why they were comfortable with the sort of detente that existed between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you know, with Ukraine being mm-hmm. Western oriented, a democracy, not under Russian control, but not outside of Russian he- hegemony. They they accepted that. Merkel, you know, who I think was a terrible leader for the, for Western democracies. Uh, you know, she was she was a patsy for Putin. You and, think Merkel was a terrible leader and a patsy for Putin? Why yeah, do you say that? Because I think that she basically empowered Putin to do what Putin is doing today. With Nord Stream 2, yeah. which totally undercut Ukraine. I mean, the life economic lifeblood of Ukraine was that pipeline. Because it flows from Russia through it, Ukraine to Germany. U, all European yeah. gas went through there. Um, and... She understood the importance of it, um, but she signed the Nord Stream 2 deal, which was going to choke off Ukraine, create a vassal state. That's what Putin was trying to do, was one, have the Europeans dependent on the pipeline that he controlled, mm-hmm. and two, kill Ukraine at the same time uh, by taking it away. I mean, Putin has been playing these moves for a long time. The West, they're not stupid. They've understood it. But they were comfortable in the little this, little that mentality. Yanukovych upset all of that because mm-hmm. Yanukovych said, "I want the Eastern Ukraine leadership wants to be part of, of Europe. The Western Ukraine leadership wants to be part of Europe. So now we're truly united as a country wanting to be part of Europe. One of the reasons I got involved with Yanukovych after I was c- convinced he uh, – would support Ukraine coming to uh, uh, into Europe. It was the, the the my feeling that Ukraine was the equivalent of Nixon going to China. Only Nixon could open up China because he came from the anti-communist right wing part of the Republican Party, and so he brought Republicans who would have been the natural opposition into the fold. Same thing was true in, as far as I was concerned in Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine needed a leader from eastern Ukraine that could help them accept becoming part of Europe, uh, minimizing the, 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 the conflicts that could exist. When Yushchenko and the Orange Revolution happened in 2004, I wasn't involved. I got involved you know, after that. Uh, and I got involved, frankly, because it's a little bit of what I was talking about earlier. Yushchenko, who was the Western candidate and who won, was renationalizing companies of eastern Ukrainian businessmen and then selling them at below bargain prices to his oligarchs. So the transition was happening, and an oligarch uh, who you know had a a, 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 a steel company uh, was hired had hired uh, Aiken Gump, a Democratic firm, and they asked me to help him as well. And that's how I got involved in Ukraine. 
Um, and, but what happened in 2004 is a result of this renationalization rep- and then privatization game that was going on is that the Eastern, European, Eastern Ukrainians decided it was time that they really got actively involved in becoming part of Europe. Because to be in the current environment that Ukraine had, it was not really getting the protections of free market principles of of of, uh, of, of uh, some of the corruption issues, uh, and so they got all in. Yanukovych convinced me that he would be supportive of it, and and I got involved. Um, so, and if you look at from that moment forward. What, where Ukraine is today? How did Yanukovych find you? Through this oligarch. Through this oligarch. Yeah. So, did you work with the oligarch in Russia first, or did no, you? He was first... not, it, well, this was a Ukrainian oligarch. You, Ukrainian, because you also work with a, a oligarch in Russia. What well, happened right? was, I worked for Oleg Deripaska. Right. Who was an, who was an oligarch? And who uh, is he exactly? He, he's the aluminum king. He's number two largest aluminum uh, company in the world. In and, Russia. Uh, he's from Russia. Yeah. He's a Russian oligarch. He had plants all over the world, I mean, natural resources that were needed for uh, aluminum and things like that. And, uh, and he hired me to help him actually involve, get involved in elections in what, these countries. What year was that? What year was that? Uh, this was probably 2005. Yeah, it was 2005. Oh, wow. So that's way before. So you, and he was in Russia at the time when you were working with him? He was in Russia at okay. the time, but my work for him was not in Russia. My work for him was in the countries in Africa and in uh, and in Ukraine where he had plants and where uh, he needed help, two types of help. Number one, protecting his interests by having you know, me help build a lot of lobbying strategy, public affairs strategy for him. Because a lot of these countries were either dictatorships were his culture, or former parts of the Soviet Union uh, in, in the stand countries like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine. Um, and so I was helping him build a and running elections for him in some of the d- democratic countries in, in Africa, like Guinea. Um, and in the course of that, he said, "You want to get involved in Ukraine because they're talking about nationalizing my, one of my plants down there in the in this pro Western government that's supposed to be against this kind of stuff." And so I went down there and I looked and I started getting involved. That's how I interacted with Aiken Gum. And that's how I then was introduced to Renat Akhmatov, who was the U- Ukrainian oligarch, who was having his countries nationalized as well. And uh, and it was because of that that, yeah, as I was helping him, Akhmatov said to me, you know, "Would you ever think of running, helping us you know, with an election here in the United in Ukraine?" I said, "Well, it's going to depend. I mean, who, who am I going to help you with? What's it going to be all about?" And he said, "Look, take a poll." See what I mean? You know our interests now because I've gotten to know the, the, some of the political interests. Figure out what we need to do, and so I did. And in the Party of Regents, which was the party of the Eastern Ukrainians, and, the, you know, and that had been discredited in the 2004 elections, uh, what I saw in that first poll was that the party wasn't really discredited as much as demoralized. America, there was support for the party in Eastern Ukraine. It was a regional support. I mean, you just like you have red states and blue states uh, here in the United States. In Ukraine, you had uh, uh, Russian you know, ethnic states, or oblasts as they call them, and, and Western-oriented oblasts, mm-hmm. which was in you know, the western part of the country. Uh, and so it became a red-blue kind of uh, breakdown. Uh, and the, the, the typical to what you see here in the United States, they didn't talk to each other. They talked over each other. They didn't listen to each other. But what I found was that the eastern part, think, as I said a few minutes ago, they did not want to. Be, they they did not want to be part of Russia. They needed. They wanted to protect their interests. The Party of Regions protected their interests because it was from the it was from the eastern part. Yanukovych was the governor of Donetsk before he ran for president. Uh, Donetsk being the one of the the biggest oblasts in the in the east, and uh, they saw him as a loser. And there was some controversy whether he tried to steal the election. Some people say Yushchenko tried. I wasn't involved. I, I never got involved in that issue. 
uh, I made it a point that whatever campaign I was going to be involved in, we were going to have an electric, election integrity component and work with all of the international organizations to bring them in to watch the elections and ballot security. And every one of, our, of the elections I was a part of, there was a major component of it where I actually had a part of my staff dealing directly with the European Union on uh, election integrity and facilitating the international observers coming in to watch the elections in all of the potential places that were corrupt. You know what's crazy? As I'm listening what's to that? Paul, this guy's a Ukraine expert. I mean, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. You know, there's a lot of people, especially on the left, they're like, oh, he's just this corrupt you know, Russian, you know, pawn. Like, this guy's been dealing with Ukrainian politics for two decades, Correct. and he's breaking it all down. I'm trying to follow what's going on in Ukrainian politics. How many Americans literally know as much about Ukrainian politics as you? No. Zero. Like, you're an expert on this. I'm the expert on it. The expert on Ukrainian uh, politics. Including with the U.S. State Department as well, by the way. That's what I'm saying here. <laughs> I feel like he could be utilized, not scrutinized, uh, that he's been by the media. Well, in but, this. but it doesn't, it's not convenient. I mean, there are, to quote Al Gore, inconvenient truths. And uh, the inconvenient truth is that they would have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that it isn't black and white. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, one of the biggest problems for Yanukovych, and the reason I think he fled, was something that I was, came down hard on, on him. Right he was corrupt. You were. But, Pat, I, but been, Yanukovych been, was corrupt. But they were all corrupt. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, if you were to say <clears throat> you can't be for Yanukovych, you have to be for X. X was just as corrupt. So Zelensky is, is also well, no, corrupt. No, I know. Zelensky is a different model. So, okay. I mean, there's a. Zelensky represents an emergence of Ukraine from the shadows of the Ukrainian, of, of, of Soviet uh, influence. I mean, he's a new style politician. He doesn't come out of politics. He hasn't, he hasn't been corrupted on the way up. Now, there are people who say, well, he's owned by one of the oligarchs uh, who is corrupt. But it's uh, almost uh, by necessity, right? Yeah, like, he was doing his thing, whatever, but now when Putin invades, he's got no other what, option. When I, did I, you realize Yanukovych was corrupt? At what Well, point? I mean, I, I didn't know how corrupt till it was over. Um, and but it would, it would show up in my polls. I mean, there was corruption that was going on, and, and uh, Barisma was one of the corrupt companies that oh, that, that, that I was wailing against. That you you've got to you know bring light onto all of this stuff, and uh, and and Burisma was managed by corrupt Yanukovych people who were partners of Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me let me ask you: while you're in it. And you're going through this and you're having, you know, you're saying 150 polls. I've been there, you know, two decades, all this stuff. What do you know on the inside of the involvement of Biden's, what they were doing, Hunter and his father? Well, did I know that he was nosing around in Ukrainian business? Yes. Did I know what he was doing? No. Did I care? No. Why? I mean, because I was working with the Obama administration. I mean, the Obama administration, the Obama embassy in, in Kiev, you know, needed my help. I mean, the, you know, one of Obama's f first major international victories was getting all of the uh, nuclear fission uh, waste product out of Ukraine. Uh, there was a big conference on you know co collecting all of uh, the the from the various Soviet countries that had nuclear byproduct. Uh, there was that were weapon grade, you know, uh, uh, nuclear product. Obama and the West was trying to put it all under control of the West, and uh, Russia was totally against it. And Yanukovych, in his first year as president, sat down with the Biden uh, with the Yan Obama, Obama administration yep. and got the deal done with huge, you know, ob ob objections being uh, uh, expressed. By Putin and, and I think it was Medvedev at the time um, uh, in Russia, and uh, and so I was working with the embassy on a regular basis. Whenever the embassy in in Kiev, U.S. embassy in Kiev, had a problem with for U.S. business companies or or uh, for something that was going on politically that they, they disagreed with what the, was happening, they'd reach out to me. And I would and I would work as an ombudsman, if you will, with them and every one of the ambassadors. Um, 
you know, it, it, from, and mundane things as getting Jeff Pyatt's dog into the country because he couldn't get it into the country. It's a big deal. Though. To him it was. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to over, working with them to make sure the international observers got to go to every d- district to watch election re- results as they wanted to. Um, and so... By the way, this, you're saying this is under the Obama administration. This is the Obama administration. Yeah, Obama and who was, was Secretary of State at that time? Hillary Clinton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Who, who reset the Russian-U.S. relationship. Right. The button that she couldn't even press correctly <laughs> uh, you know, to reset the relationship. I mean, you know, so when you hear Rachel Maddow and people talk about, I was working with this Russian oligarch in 2005, 6, and 7, because that's when I worked with him, uh, who's, very cl- who's very close to... to uh, to Putin now, uh, but wasn't then, and he wasn't part of it then, um, it, it's no different than when Obama became president. And I was working, you know, Obama set the reset with Russia, not Paul Manafort. Um, and what he reset was you know, the, the, time, the political relationship between the two countries. My oligarch that I was working with was at a different time. But now the stink of Putin today and the image of, of, of Putin today is being held up as what I was dealing with and for with Deripaska back in 2000. It's totally different. But there's no distinction between Putin and, and U.S. attitudes in Russia from 2004 you know, with, with Bush to 2009 and 10, resetting it with Obama and Clinton, uh, to 2013 when Putin went to war against Ukraine and the West. And even then, Obama blinked and let Putin get away with it, which is why... With Crimea, you're saying. With Crimea and what he tried to do with these, quote, independent eastern uh, uh, zones of uh, of influence in Ukraine, uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk. So... It's just all blurred together. Hmm. And there's no distinction between you could have been for Medvedev when he was president. The U.S. was looking at him as potentially being the end of Putin. Now, and and because they viewed Medvedev as a bureaucrat and somebody who didn't come out of the KGB. Uh, And so his his one term of president uh, that Putin actually put him in on, they were hoping he would become a two-term president, and Putin would fade into history. And if that had happened, I think the world would be very different today. But they didn't do anything to help Medvedev. Uh, and they, and it, at that time, I was trying to promote uh, you know, d- uh, Western uh, foreign policy because I saw the difference between Medvedev and Putin and how that could impact hmm. the world, but also, more importantly, from my vision at that time, Ukraine. Wasn't Medvedev uh, the the individual who uh, uh, Obama got caught with a hot mic? Correct. Isn't that the yeah. conversation? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what yeah. was the space. so? It, it, what are your thoughts on what happened there? Well, I mean that's another part of the hypocrisy of the attacks against me. I mean here, uh, you know, he, M- Obama gets caught on the hot mic saying to Medvedev, "Tell Vlad I can be a lot more flexible in dealing with him after my election." Because this was done, and Second I think, term, yeah. this was done, I think, in the fall of, of 2012, um, and, uh, and and Obama meant it. He wanted to be more flexible and, and broaden relationships. Partially, I think, because he recognized that Putin was not going to let Medvedev have a second term, and he was going to have to deal with. Uh, you know, he's saying to the current president, Medvedev, tell the prime minister, "I'm going to be more flexible." What is that? What kind of signal does that send? Well, Medvedev, you're still the lackey, and Putin, you're still the power, even though Medvedev, you're the president. Yeah, and, and the Russians know how, Putin in particular knows how to read these signals. Um, and, and so, guess what happens in 2013? 2013, you have the you have the uh, revolt in Russia, in, U, in Ukraine, and uh, in 2014, Crimea gets invaded because Obama, Putin doesn't fear Obama. They, you know, and then he puts. Who does the, Putin fear? Well, right now he probably fears Zelensky. You <laughs> think so? I mean, he respects him a lot more. He'll never say that, but you know, he's just 
Zelensky with a with a citizen militia has just defeated the Russian. The Russian okay, Army. but that's 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 misleading because it's not a citizen militia just by itself. They're backed and armed to the teeth by the United States government. No, they're we've not. sent them. No, no, we've sent not. them fifteen billion dollars in federal and in, in military aid. Okay. We are now switching from Soviet era weapons to NATO weapons. We're also providing providing them intelligence. So it's not just a citizen well, militia. Well, the, they are completely backed in a proxy war by the United States. Well, no, I mean I, I, you're, you've t- you've blended it all together. Together. They, the, what they did the first month, it, it, where they blunted the the, so, the Russian uh, invasion in Kiev, was done with the remnants of the lethal aid that Trump gave them. Obama wasn't giving them lethal aid in the first but there's, year. There's, again, Let they're still finish. backed by the state, so whether it's well, Trump, of course, they or or Biden. They're still backed by the United States. Well, barely. Now, now Biden has gotten much more active. He's the, the two the Secretary of State and. And the uh, Minister of Defense have just gone gone to to uh, Ukraine because he's got to. <laughs> Why though? Because because it's, one, it's the right thing to do. Yes, but but I, I I wonder how this ends up because even back in 2016 in the Obama doctrine, Obama was interviewed by a uh, uh, David Goldberg of the Atlantic and said and said that the United States has no interest in Ukraine because Russia can always exert dominance over there. That there's no interest to us. Okay, so so again, it's it may be the right thing to do, but why is it the right thing for us to do? Okay, we're well, continually providing aid, we're pro- continually providing intelligence, and day after day we get more and more involved in this proxy war with the uh, second strongest nuclear power in the world. Okay, you've said a bunch of things that you need to break down here because number one, you said correctly what Obama's policy was, which was it's not our it's not our backyard. Mm-hmm. Okay, I happen to think forty four million people who want to be part of the West deserve to be given the tools they need to become a part of the West. I also happen to believe that Putin showed his teeth in 2014 when he invaded Crimea, and we didn't do a thing. We barely registered objection. No sanctions of serious nature were put on. There were sanctions, but they were not significant. Uh, And what happened as a result of that? Putin then moved into eastern Ukraine uh, in 2014. That got stopped pretty much because of Ukrainians, not because of the West, uh, and, and pressure that the Europeans were starting to feel now, and it was an election year coming up uh, in the United States. Then, so, so now Putin sees all of that. Mm-hmm. Trump becomes president, and, and Obama refuses to give any lethal aid, any lethal aid, which people here don't follow, but the people over there do. Right. And they understood the significance of that. Putin understood the significance of it, so did the Ukrainians. And so how did the Ukrainians get their weapons in 2016? Through mercenaries, through, you know, the arms, you know, the underground arms operation. Um, and, uh, and that's how they were able to get some, but not enough. Then Trump gets elected president. What does Trump do for almost first thing he's in first year in office? He gives lethal aid. Now, Putin is seeing a change in the leadership of the country. You know, this pro-Putin pres- new president, Donald Trump, is given lethal aid and has said, don't mess with, with, with Ukraine. Putin pays attention to that. Biden gets elected president. Biden brings in the same foreign policy team that was dealing with this area under, under Obama. New titles, new chairs, but it's the same team. Putin understands what that means. First thing Biden does is he makes the United States energy dependent, again, by shutting down uh, new production. Mm-hmm. Second thing he does is he removes the sanctions that Trump put on, on Nord Stream 2, mm-hmm. which were serious sanctions. No, absolutely. And what, what does that Putin see there? Okay, I got the, I got the Obama mm-hmm. foreign policy team in place now. I got Biden helping me you know, and build my, my, my energy uh, uh, position in the world. Uh, and because the U.S. is going to be becoming a net exp- importer, the, the extra flow of, 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 of gas is coming from Russia, from third parties, which means he's making billions of dollars more to fundle his war machine in Moscow. So he sees all of that, and then he says you know, to, to the West, don't bring anybody into NATO. What were his conditions for peace, not, not having him invade Ukraine? He wanted... The commitment that Ukraine would be not be part of NATO. Well, Ukraine said they were not prepared to be right, a part of NATO. They were never going to be a part of that, NATO. So that wasn't an issue. But then he said, and I want all NATO country borders with military, Western military, NATO troops to be, go back to 1997. Mm-hmm. You know what 1997 was? That's when the Soviet Union basically fell apart. And so what he was saying is, 
he wants no NATO troops in any of Eastern and Central Europe and also in the Baltics. He, he wants to pull back on, on the, the, the Latvia and Estonia. Mm-hmm. No, that, that wasn't a peace gesture. That was a war gesture. Well, and I, I think you're correct. Let's not forget that Trump was impeached because he threatened to withhold federal aid from Ukraine. You're correct about that. Well, and, and nobody. No, no, well, we can go into that in a separate issue, but we're going to confuse the uh, the conversation. I think we should stick on this, but, and then we can talk right, about he, that. He, he did send federal uh, lethal aid to Ukraine, and and. Again, nobody's saying what, what Vladimir Putin is doing is correct, right? If 44 million people want to be free, they have the right to be free. But again, I ask, where does this end up? Why is that our responsibility? Well, I didn't say and how was, does this no, end? I didn't say that was our What you took objection to is me saying that uh, that Ukraine it blunted in the first month the, the Russian invasion by using a citizen militia. That's what I said. Well, that, and, and, and that's what I said. And what you didn't, I didn't get a chance to, but now I'll give you a chance to become relevant on your comment, to say that what the West should have been doing from that point was facilitating what Ukraine needed in order to defend themselves because we are committed to free freedom and democracy, and you're talking about 44 million people. Who are dealing. I'm not saying we should have put troops in there. I am saying we should have allowed the, the air equipment to go in there. Now we are. Why are we now allowing it to go in there? Because it it's, it's now apparent that Ukraine can use them and win. Uh, mm. But back then, we didn't want to get drawn in. Why? Because Putin was threatening us, like he's now threatening us with nuclear weapons. Putin is a bully. Bullies f- push until they find a wall. Yeah. Putin's got a problem. He can't win Ukraine. And he's not going to be able to win Ukraine because of the Ukrainian people if they're given the tools they need to defend themselves. The Poles understand this. Why are the Poles on the front line here? Because they know if Ukraine falls to and, and, and becomes part of Russia, they're the border, and they know what that means. Damn. And hey, hey, Pat, you're doing a lot of listening, right? You're probably processing everything in Poland. Thanks, Tyler, getting in on it. Uh, how are you processing all this? There's must you must. I mean, you've done a whole episode on Ukraine. You've watched uh, Ukraine on fire. Be, yeah. Everything. What, but there's a, there's a difference between like uh, watching an episode and being right. on the inside. And uh, no matter how many papers I read, I'm, you, you you don't know until mm-hmm. you're dealing directly with Yanukovych and you know all, oligarchs, and you're doing the you're you're there for a few years. I think the question would be the following. So. American military news comes out yesterday, two days ago. Russia warns World War III very, risk is very significant. So Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned on Monday that the risk of a third world war cannot be underestimated and said the U.S. and NATO are adding to the risk by supplying weapons to Ukraine. Lavrov said Russia agreed on the inadmissibility of nuclear war and said avoiding such conflict is our principal position, however— he warned that now the risks are very significant. He particularly criticized the U.S. for supplying manned, portable, anti-aircraft missile launchers and anti-tank javelin missiles, which he said could be used for terrorist attacks. So is this just a threat, or do, is this a bluff, or do you think things can get pretty ugly there? You know what happens when you capit- capitulate to a bully? They keep moving. And, and, you know, this, Is it a threat? Yeah, is it a threat. Is it a serious threat? I don't know. Um, I know that they are, they're losing and they know that and so they're getting desperate and so they're making these crazy uh, accus- or, or threats. Uh, but frankly, you know, the moment we capitulate is the moment the world becomes more dangerous, not less dangerous. Because the bully understands where the red line doesn't mean a red line anymore. And, and when they start getting away with a nuclear threat, then what happens in, in Estonia? When, they, when the Russian ethnic population in Estonia that Putin is stirring up right now, you know, he, he, what happens when he gets them to do like what he did in eastern Ukraine and say they, they're not having their interests protected and Russia's got to go in there now and protect them? Well, no, they're a NATO country. Uh, you know, so if, 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 if Moscow goes in the, into Estonia, I, I, you know, are we going to give in? Um, and if we've given in on the nuclear threat on Ukraine, We'll give in on the nuclear threat in Estonia. And all of a sudden, the Balkans go, go back. All of a sudden, Sweden and Finland are talking about maybe becoming a part of NATO. Why? Because they feel threatened now. They didn't, they've, for years, they've always said neutrality. We don't need to be a part of NATO. All of a sudden, they're changing. Germany, I mean, I, I mean, this is one of the big surprises to me. 
Yeah, they, the Chancellor of Germany is a social democrat, which is the party that's affiliated with Putin's party, you know, where you have these affiliations yeah. uh, internationally. Uh, and he's rearming Germany. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's historic. Why? Because now Germany started. This guy recognizes his country is worried. I mean, he's got his relationships with Putin. <laughs> but the country is worried that Germany's borders now are mm-hmm. could, could potentially be but at should risk. Be worried that, should the world be worried if Germany starts arming itself? I mean, they don't exactly have the best reputation no, they don't. arms, right? No, but the point I'm getting at is you got all these things, things swirling around. Nothing is black and white. Putin is causing all of the swirling around. Uh, and so when he starts threatening us with doomsday and we give in, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Let me ask you, we talk about him being a bully. Uh, how different was his relationship with Trump versus Biden? I, I was preoccupied during those days. So, so, you know, my understanding of it is what you saw uh, in the papers as well. I never thought Trump was pro-Putin. I think you know, Trump's foreign policy, and it's true in, it was true in Russia, it was true everywhere, it was true in, in North Korea, was personal diplomacy. He believed, I mean, the, the, the Donald Trump I know believes that when he can look you in the face and he can talk to you, you'll understand his resolve. And if you understand his resolve, that ability to understand it will allow for things to happen. Uh, you know, from in, 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 in theory, the, Moscow and Putin, he, there, no Russian invasions happened anywhere during Trump's presidency. Why? Because I believe Putin understood Trump wouldn't tolerate it. Um, and so what they talked about, I have no idea. But I do know that just like North Korea would rattle, rattle the sabers before Trump was president, they went quiet after, after Trump met with Kim Jong-un. Trump's conversations with Putin, Putin went quiet. Um, and uh, and even China. I mean, I happen to think if, if Trump had been reelected, I think they would have finished the uh, the international tariff negotiations, and then you would have seen a new kind of approach on foreign policy with Xi Jinping uh, by, by Trump because he would have fixed what he thought was the first problem, and then he'd be dealing with the political relationship, all on a personal basis. Um, and so I, I don't know what Trump and Putin talked about. I just know the consequence, the results of his presidency. And the results were very positive for freedom-loving countries. So before we transition out from the story of uh, Ukraine and the story of uh, 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 Russia, Putin, uh, the story with you, in the world of lobbyists, okay, and that's the business you've been in since 1980, you know, when you got into the business. You know, when they talk about you going to jail, what did you really go get sentenced 47 months for? Some are saying Russia, some are saying the $10 million loan from the oligarchs, some are saying the $60 million from Ukraine. What was the real uh, reason at the end that you got 47 months? There, there was no $10 million loan from oligarchs. There was no loans from oligarchs. Uh, was, that was a bank loan that they accused me of, a uh, U.S. bank. Um, what I was villainized for was being pro-Putin, you know, uh, traitor to my country, uh, um, yeah, what I was convicted of were legal issues, which I talk about in the book, uh, that uh, that I'd already been cleared up on, already been cleared up on in in the ferry issues, on the tax issues, on the the F bar, which is the offshore accounts issues, and, and I'm not going to get into them today, but uh, but in the book I get into them in detail, um, and you need to understand the, the the context, and that was exactly what Weissman's strategy was: was to confuse the context, to make me a villain in the in the uh, in the media, and then get me convicted on just overcharging and just dop, dropping hundreds of thousands of documents, millions of pages, Weisman and putting me the, in solitary, putting me in solitary, so I couldn't really prepare myself. Weissman being the right hand guy for Mueller, right? When you're saying Weisman, what? Weisman ran at least my case, he ran right. it, he ran it, but I think he ran the whole. Special what, what role did Letitia, Letitia Jackson play? Letitia James. I'm sorry, James. Letitia James play. No. She, no. She's the Attorney General in New York. But she was trying to go after Trump, you know, God knows how many different things they were trying to find. They couldn't find anything except for, you know, the CEO, you know, who apparently Trump gave him a Ferrari, Ferrari or something like that. They couldn't find anything else. So I guess the question for you would be the following. From 1980 till you going. Uh, 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 getting to 47 months. 
How often Ford, Reagan, all these guys you work with, how often were you a target the way you were a target the moment you started help, helping out Trump? Never. Never. So you've never been a target like the... Not that I know. So why, why this level of hatred towards targeting Trump versus every, everybody else you supported was also Republican? What's different between Trump and everyone else? The, 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 the world has changed. I mean, number one, social media. Uh, uh, number two, I mean, social media was Trump's, uh, uh, helped Trump facilitate Trump's election, and it dominated social, Trump's presidency. Um, you know, we used to have, in the, going back to four days, there was one news cycle, and you got, you used between eight in the morning until about three in the afternoon to get on the three network news programs that night. Uh, and that, that was the way you built your, your strategy for the day. By the time you know, Ray, the second Reagan's second term and, ba- and Jim Baker mastered this, we had two cycles. We had the morning cycle and the afternoon cycle so that we dominated what was in the news in the <coughs> evening and what you saw in the papers in the morning. Um, today, you have a 24-hour cycle. And uh, you've also had journalism, mainstream journalism, change. Uh, it used to be that you know the fact checkers were the most important part of any any uh, any articles you read in the non editorial pages fact checkers don't exist anymore for mm-hmm. it's first to file not first to get the facts and and that's driven by the social media to some respect and it's the social media has you know the, is dominated the, the mainstream media's because the mainstream media's how do how do these new reporters grow grown into national celebrities the the articles they get, they get, they get they get to be writing and, and also the the coverage they get on the TV talk shows and the clicks how many clicks so that if their articles get clicks they the more clicks they get uh, the more attention that brings to to them the more attention it brings to them it's helped their economics uh, and what gets clicks news or yeah, or or I want to sensationalism I want I want to say okay it's social media but Nixon got targeted hardcore, you know, when they were after him. You know, a lot, you know, we can give names of people. Of course, post media coming out, first debate being John F. Kennedy and Nixon on TV, where it was no longer radio. On radio, Nixon's winning on TV. He's not. But the targeting has happened for a while. Maybe not at the levels that we have today, right? The with, intensity, with, intensity. So, yes. but why though? That's what I want to know. Forget the social media side. Why? Why specifically towards Trump? Well. Again, well, I think the main reason for Trump, and I get into this in the book, is because he threatened the system. Not Democrats, the system. He was going to drain the swamp. The swamp wasn't the Democrats. The swamp was Washington. The swamp was New York. The swamp was the elites versus the people. The, to quote Hillary Clinton, the basket of deplorables. That's they were they were coming coming not since Andrew Jackson were were the people coming to the streets of Washington the way they were under Trump, really. I mean, you look at all of the you know, the changes, the FDR, uh, you know, even Abraham Lincoln. You you didn't have an attack on the system the way you did when Trump or Andrew Jackson, depending on how you want to do it, became president. And so, and and they weren't ready for it. In Trump's case, nobody was ready for Trump to be president except Trump's supporters, and they were the quiet, still to quote Nixon, silent majority. I mean, they were hoping. Uh, I felt Trump was going to win the whole time in 2016. I wrote a memo which they tried, Weissman tried to make into a uh, something it wasn't in on Thursday before the election in 2016 that I sent to them to the president, to Jared, and to Wright's previous, who was running the RNC at the time, where I said that Trump is going to win on on Tuesday. And I wrote the memo on Thursday specifically because I felt that there was still time the week before for Clinton to change. If Clinton had run a smart last 10 days of the campaign, she could have won. I'm not saying she would have, but she could have. By Thursday, it was too late. She couldn't do, in my mind, what had to be done in the states where I thought Nick, uh, Trump would win. So I wrote a memo that said that it's really important this weekend that we get out there and make people understand we're going to win. I said, the media's not going to believe it uh, in the memo. 
Uh, but we have to put the marker down because when we do hit on the on Tuesday, I said, they're gonna no one's gonna understand how this happened, and and they're gonna try and say we stole the election, uh, and we didn't. Uh, and some of them, some of what I asked for, they suggested it happened, happened. But I'm not saying it was because of my memo. Um, but my point was that the system wasn't expecting Reg, uh, Trump to win, and so the combination of he's going to drain the swamp. Nobody expected him to be standing on Wednesday after the election. The, the people crying, the schools, clo- teachers' unions closing schools because that was epic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when did we ever have that happen? Yeah. When did we ever have that happen? Uh, but that became the defining atmosphere for Trump's presidency. I, I guess what I'm asking is the following. By the way, some people may even say, you know, you uh, are part of the swamp as a lobbyist. You know, I think lobbyists. Would you say lobbyists have done a lot of damage? I think lobbyists. Well, it depends on what they do. I mean, lo- lobbying is government affairs. What is? Go- I mean, you walk to into an office of a congressman. You think they're the experts on all the topics they're dealing with in the committees? No. A good government affairs firm is providing information for people to make decisions. Now, there is corruption within the system. What good does a lobbyist do? Like, if I were to say a you know, what What good does a cop do? Okay, I can say what good a cop does. What good does a military soldier do? What good does a whoever do? What good, what good does a they lobbyist provide do? provide information, factual information, on whatever the issues is, are that they're representing. Uh, in the case of foreign government, representing foreign governments, they facilitate understanding because people, they don't, they, they don't, people don't talk the same to each other. They don't understand the same to each other. And, and, and a, a good lobbyist, which has become a, a pejorative term, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but a good lobbyist is somebody who brings information, finds out what the problems are, goes back and gets responses to the problems, and comes back. And that's the mundane work that gets done in the legislative process and the regulatory process all the time. Um, what you read about are the excesses. Uh, Hunter Biden going into the State Department and saying that uh, we need to keep we have, we need to back off on prosecutors uh, in Ukraine uh, com- coming down on Burisma. That's that's what lobbying is viewed, but that's not lobbying. Aren't, aren't, aren't that's, aren't that's political uh, political influence? Wouldn't you say lobbies are like the ultimate spinners, though? Like they're the ultimate spinners. They'll spin any story into. They'll use some factual things and then they'll spin it into whatever story or narrative they want to tell. But it is a form. They're like the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate spinners. Well, they. That's one of the things they do. Yes, absolutely. But again, don't deceive yourself. The system in Washington is not meant for congressmen to know everything and their staffs to know everything about all the issues that they and the committees they sit on. They need information from outside to make informed decisions. And good lobbyists provide that information. They it's it's there's some of it is spinning. The congressmen have to in the end make judgments. But isn't it all money driven? Meaning like a lobbyist is gonna Tell them that information based on how much they're getting paid by that company that repre- that they represent. But, but, the, but the member of Congress understands that the lobbyist is showing up on behalf of AT and T, mm-hmm. and so if that comes with a certain frame yeah. of understanding. Um, and the information they're getting from AT and T, they get, and they have to contextualize that versus what they're getting from a company that's opposing AT and T, you know, buying Time Warner or whatever the case might be. What would happen uh, if lobbyists were just completely eliminated? Then you would have a lot of legislation that was uninformed. <laughs> that but, would be, but, but watch this, though. Yeah. Check this out. So, about half of retiring senators and a third of retiring House members retire as lobbyists. Well, so, but, yeah. the, the, but, but let's you know every, every, you, we've got this image in our head of lobbyists. You know who's a lobbyist? Who the teachers union? Okay, yeah. teachers union's a lobbyist. I agree. So you're going to take them out? No, no one's talking about taking the teachers union out. They're talking about taking a lobbying company out. But the teachers' union is a lobbyist. Uh, AARP is a lobbyist. They're, all, they're also there's an element of them that's also corrupt. But though. my point is, there's a role they serve. Mm-hmm. And when you start saying take lobbyists out of the equation, you're taking everybody out of the equation. Who, who would win elections if there was no lobbyist? Like, let's just say it's 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 criminal to hire lobbyists or lobbyist firm. Who who would that favor the most if all of that was gone and out? I don't even know how you could do that to start with, but if you, I mean, but if you're saying take take 
lobbyists out, you're really, I think what you're saying is take the money out of contributions. Sure, if there's no yeah. money, there's no lobby yeah. in them. But again, that means the teachers union doesn't get to mm-hmm. contribute. The AFL-CIO doesn't get to contribute. I mean, start, and you think they're going to give that up? <laughs> no way. I'm not like, saying they're going to give it up. Of course, by the way, I, I actually don't think it's going to happen. Not in my lifetime. I'm 43. It ain't going to happen in my lifetime. But all I'm asking is, you know, if we did in everywhere... Who does it hurt? Who does it benefit? Look, I, I think done correctly, it hurts good legislation. I mean, if you if you I mean, if you take out the information flow that lobbying companies that you bring to the system, how does a member of Congress get their information? Where are they going to get it? They're not. They're not going to intuitively know. The technicalities of of, of of big tech uh, and the the exemptions that they have uh, as uh, from from publishing, they're not going to totally know a, that. A friend of mine was a was a lobbyist and a very high paid lobbyist. He made very good money, okay, mm-hmm. very very good money. And he left and got into a complete different industry. I said, "So why'd you get into lobbying?" He said, "Because you can make a lot of money. I made a lot of money." I said, "Okay, this whole thing about you know politics is dirty and all this stuff." He says, "Listen." It, it, some of the stuff I did as a lobbyist, it eventually got to a point where I'm like, holy shit, if I continue like this, this thing's eventually going to catch up to me with what we're doing with our team. How how ugly is the world of lobbying, meaning the power plays? It, is, is it, you know how, okay, we ask this question regularly, We you know, hey, if you want to build a championship to, in football, what matters the most? The GM, the owner, the quarterback, the running back, the defense, blah, 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 all this stuff you go through. Offensive coordinator, recruit, who do you put up there, right? If we want somebody to win, okay, if we want somebody to win, to a candidate to win, how important of a role does a lobbyist play to help that person win? How important of, of a role does a lobbyist play to get an Amazon who moves a part of their headquarters closer to you know Virginia or D.C. to pass some laws? How important of a role do lobbyists play to pass some of these laws for them? In, in the, well, the, those are two different things: getting elected versus govern. Both of them. You know, yeah, getting elected. You know, money is important, but it, money comes from a lot of sources, not just lobbyists. So I, I would not make lobbying as the distinction. I mean, there are probably people, and uh, Republicans probably feel like they're outmanned in getting uh, by the Democrats in getting lobbyist money. If you look at lo- lobbyist money, most of it goes to Democrats. A lot of it does. Um, but I don't think that matters to getting elected. I think what matters getting elected is the, your issue agenda, and then as an incumbent, what you've done. At the end of the day, the American people usually figure things out. I'm a big believer in our system. Uh, they usually figure things out. They can be fooled for an election cycle, um, but they de- they generally figure things out. And so lobbying, to me, is more impactful in governance, not in elections. Money's going to come from somewhere regardless. You take lobbying money out, it's still going to come from somewhere. <clears throat> and, and so getting elected is a different paradigm from my standpoint. As far as governing is concerned, lobbying plays a constructive role. If you you frame it things correctly, it's still going to be up to the member to make a decision on the information that he gets, um, and it's not like it's happening in a vacuum. A lobbying you get lobbyists on both sides of issues, more oftentimes than multiple sides of issues, uh, and so yes, that puts a uh, a responsibility on the member to understand the facts, but that's part of his job is to understand the facts. You got to make sure he gets the facts. And if he's getting both sides of the facts, he's got enough to make judgments. I would you know, make the point that special interests are not particularly necessarily lobbyists that control members of Congress, but industries. And how do you get, I mean, and that's part of, if you come from a coal mining area, coal mining industry is going to have an impact mm-hmm. on the members of Congress from that area. Is that wrong? Probably not, because that's the area they're, they're from, and they need to understand those issues. Um, it's where where I have my problem with Washington and where I think Trump tapped into something in 2016 was where members of Congress will be for something when they're in power, and then when they lose power, they're against what they were for on, on an issue. And uh, and that hypocrisy hmm. gets is what gets gets. Give an example. Obama or Trump? 
Um, I mean, it, it, neither in that sense. I'm talking more congressional. I mean, I'll give you an example. It's, it's, a, politi- it's a, 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 a political one, but it's nonetheless the filibuster in the Senate. I mean, you've seen all the clips, Schumer and the Democrats being against the, the filibuster being removed when they had the, when they were in the minority in the Senate, and now they're for the filibuster being uh, uh, get, getting rid of it. Why? Because it enhances their power. So it's, the equation is defined by what it does for power, not what it does for democracy. Um, McConnell's it, done the same thing. Same it's, thing. It's, it's, uh, both sides. And, and, McC- and uh, Trump campaigned against both of them. Mm-hmm. He, they were the McConnell swamp. McConnell can't stand Trump, by the way. Yeah, well, they're, it's, all. it's probably yeah. mutual. Not it's probably. It is mutual. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. It. <laughs> but yeah. the point is, why doesn't Trump like McConnell? Because McConnell to Trump is the same thing as Schumer is to Trump as far as... He's just a swamp creature? He's a swamp creature. Why doesn't McConnell like Trump? Because McConnell is a swamp creature and Trump wants to get rid of the swamp. He's a disruptor. Yeah, and so... And the, and Will they the, ever see eye to eye, no, McConnell and no, Trump? No, I was. There's there. no hope for reconciliation. Well, there? no, there's always hope for reconciliation because there'll be mutuality of interest. Hmm. Uh, the, the, will they ever like each other? No, but will they ever work together? Yeah, I think they would. Hey, Pat, it would seem. Tell me if I'm wrong here. We're talking about lobbyists. Back to that. Paul's almost defending lobbyists. I would say that you would. I mean, as a lobbyist, hello. I mean, a political yeah. consultant as well. You would think that there's a role that there's a role and that they are a net positive to governance. Whereas Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, at the end of the day, you think lobbyists are a net negative to America. Am I wrong on that? <laughs> okay, so here's how I see it. Okay, you know the whole conversation between sales and marketing. Yep. What sales? What's marketing? Mm-hmm. Right. Marketing spreads. Sales is one dimensional. Marketing is like a story. Goes out like Coca Cola. Mm-hmm. Share a Coke with Jose, yeah. with Adam. Like, oh my God! I don't even drink Coke, but hey, I got this great campaign. Came out of Australia. Coke took off. They become who they become, right? I think lobbyists are the ultimate CMOS. <laughs> mm-hmm. They'll do laps around CMOS at major corporations. Like if a major corporation wants to hire a real good CMO, go freaking put on an ad and say, "I'm looking for former lobbyists <laughs> who helped somebody win." I'll give you. There's a, a lot million of congressmen that would have I would. That job. I tell you, <laughs> like he would make one hell of a CMO mm-hmm. at a major corp. And I'm being very uh, frank with you. I'm being yeah. very serious because the strategy they take with research and data and gathering then and telling the story and saying it in a way where. You're like, man, this thing makes sense. It's a very powerful job. But ah, it's the ultimate spin zone, though. It's the ultimate spin zone. In my opinion, I may be wrong. And by the way, let's just say one day you get into politics. If the other guy's using lobbyists, guess what we got to get for you? We got to get some solid lobbyists on you because if you're going to use it, I have to use it. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to do it where, hey, you're going to use it. Oh, we're going to become these noble people. We're not going to use it. No, you have to. So he makes the point about, so what do you want to do? Teachers union? Should we get rid of them? I mean, if both sides are going to use it, you have to use it, okay? That, that, that's the part where once you get into that game, yeah. that shit is dirty, and you, you wanna, you're you going to play that game against me? Watch how better of a job I'm going to maneuver against you. No. And you may disagree with me, no, no, but that's my assessment no, on the no, world of lobbying. Look, I, I mean, I understand the point. And, and you know, by the way, Donald Trump would agree with a lot of what you just said. Um, but, uh, but the point is, what are you going to replace it with? I mean, if you can't expect Congress, especially in today's day and age, to be experts on it, all the things they have to be experts on. Mm-hmm. And you can't, they, they can't, there's not enough staff for them, the money for the staff they would need to have an expert on this, an expert on this, an expert on this, et cetera. So you have to have a role. Now, yeah, right. how, how you frame the, the role to protect the concerns that you have, that's a different issue. But the, the, to say that throw the baby in the bathwater out, that's not yeah. that it's not realistic, uh, and it, frankly, I think is harmful to the system. I, I disagree with a lot of what the teachers union stand for as far as what they think they can do with the with our kids in school. But I see a role for them. And they're massive bullies, though. Well, they are the massive, teachers bullies. massive bullies. They're massive bullies because yeah. they have the power to be a massive bully. Yeah. So that, and, but but again, it goes back because we've empowered them. I think in eighteen seven, I don't know what the year was when they were trying to eliminate lobbies and create laws and all this stuff. So this has been going on for a while. Where you know they knew this was eventually because some of these guys were going to become more powerful than actual presidents, congressmen, and senators. Yeah. Some lobbies are more powerful than. You know, Jim Baker, you, you've read his book. I'm sure you've read it. If you haven't read his book, I yeah, couldn't yeah. put the book down, by the way. 
some of the stuff he was talking about in there, on the stories of what happened, you know, Jim Baker's more powerful than most of these guys that became presidents. Yeah. Jim, he could have become a president, but he chose to play a different role, you know? Jim so Baker. I, yeah, I, I think... Uh, again, I think I think lobbyists, uh, yeah. uh, uh, in a big way, make the political world. Well, you know, what I just, you know, I just thought of with far as lobbyists, because you you at one point said, well, they represent industries. This guy's a beast, by the way. You said industries. Yeah. Lobbyists represent industry. We met initially at an insurance conference. Yeah, Nalba, ten years ago. Yeah, that's probably the biggest brokerage uh, industry meeting. There's another one called AALU. You probably are familiar with that. Yes. Uh, they've changed their name since then, but it's the insurance advocacy group in D.C. Every year the meeting is in D.C. We're in the insurance business, financial services business. The whole point of that meeting is to get all the insurance people to D.C. to do our meeting. And then what do they all do? Go to the Hill to meet with our congressmen to basically uh, promote the importance of insurance and you know financial wellness in the family. So there is... There is an upside, you know, even to us. But 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 the reason why they need that, because yeah. on the other side, Elizabeth Warren's got the best of the best who's lobbying against hurting yes. people in the financial industry. So you have to have the counterattack. That's, exactly. that's my point earlier. Right. If you're going to use it, I have to hire yeah. this lobbyist. And that's what if, he's saying if, is if, that like you, my, can't, you can't yeah, throw out the baby point. with the bathwater. I, like I don't disagree with you too far in, deep. in that and, part. And, and, you know, and yes, there are excesses. Yeah. Um, again, part of my biggest problem with and why I think why I believe that Trump was going to win in 2016 was because you Washington becomes s- s- segmented, segregate, segregated, and they focus on what's in their interest and not in the people whose interests they're there representing, meaning the American people. Um, and it bothers me. And, and I got out of American politics until for about eight years when I was over in Ukraine because I was fed up with being part of a system where when people got elected and came to Washington, they didn't worry about uh, their promises as much as they worried about building a power base inside Washington. And that was true of Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. And and the hypocrisy that I said a minute ago, using the filibuster example, but that is true throughout on issues and on, uh, on it's, it's power-based. And that bothered me. And uh, did I think I could change the system? No. I couldn't change this. So I just said, okay. Um, Come on, Paul. You could have done it. No. Well, I did, and actually, because I then changed my mind in 2016 when I saw somebody who could do it, huh. and and I got back in the game. Um, and, do, you and regret, I, do you regret it? No. Not at all? No. Do you, do you think when you wrote that uh, article Thursday of 2016, right before Tuesday, saying this guy's going to win it, do you feel that way about him in 2024, that Trump is going to win it? Because I don't think DeSantis is going to run. I don't think DeSantis wants to be on the same stage with Trump because it's going to get ugly. Oh, I don't think DeSantis runs if Trump runs. I agree. I, I think if Trump runs, it freezes the field. I mean, there'll be somebody, I mean, whether it's uh, Bill Weld again or uh, you know, H- uh, Hogan uh, uh, or, K- or Kasich, somebody will run. It won't matter. Mm-hmm. Trump, will, Trump will dominate. On the Republican primary side. On the Republican side. primary side. Yeah. Um, what are the chances he runs? 100%? Well, I think Biden is making it easier every day. I well, mean, Biden won't be running again in no, 2024. But, we all know that. But you got to look at what you got. Now we have to project what's 2024 going to look like. Mm-hmm. Well, we have to look at it through the prism of two things the Biden administration and the 2022 elections. The Biden administration Midterm. has failed on all of the key issues that Trump was succeeding on, and to the point where I couldn't believe this. There's a, I mean, I, I think the poll is an outlier poll 19%. Of the people who voted for him want him to run again in 2024. Now think about that for a minute. I did the, yeah. Biden got 80 million votes. 19 percent of Biden, right? Want so him to 16 run? 16 million out of the 80. That's my point. Do the math. That's embarrassing. Do you, can you? He's who, wrote, who gave in, that number? What poll? Was, I think it was Harris's poll. I think it was Mark Penn's poll. Holy Why is that shit. number shocking though? 80, in one and a half years, he's what lost mean, 60 that million people that yeah, voted they, for him. They, they weren't voting for him, Paul. You know that. But, but I, They were voting against Trump. You know this. Well, some of them were. But my point is... Nobody's like, hell yeah, but Joe's my guy. They said, Donald Trump's not my guy, and I'll take anyone else. Well, that, we can get into that in a minute. But the point is still, to me, that's shocking. And, and Pat, Pat picked it up. 60 million people who voted for him within a year have said, I don't want him to run again. Mm-hmm. That's an incredible number. 
Uh, and uh, but it, but, you, but now get underneath the numbers. What does it mean? Young people. Now, why do you think they're talking about you know student debt again? Because young people, I think there's like sixty percent of his vote in twenty twenty. You know, he's down in the thirties. Thirty three percent of young people said they would vote for him if they show up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got an issue on turnout, and then you got to show up. Of who turns out, it's not going to vote. You know, thir- a third is going to vote for him. You look at Hispanics. So this was a movement that was starting in 2016. It was already starting uh, to move on cultural issues and on the economy. Those are the things that are important to Latino in the Latino community. Um, Trump accelerated that a little bit, um, and Biden, in one year as, as president, is accelerating even more for Republicans uh, to the point that. We could Republicans could carry a majority of the Hispanic vote uh, in, in, in twenty twenty four. Yeah, well, if I you mean, do, it's a layup to, well, to that, win. Them. That's why it's a, that's why it yeah. looks like a layup for twenty twenty two. And what does that mean? Well, that means that these developing uh, segments of the voting population are moving away from their traditional place. And once it starts to move, it doesn't just come back. Um, and What's going to happen as a result of that in 2023? 23. What will happen, in my judgment, is the Republicans are going to win both houses of Congress. More importantly is what happens in the House. The plurality in the House of the Democratic Caucus is going to be the left. It's going to be the AOC types. Um, maybe not the leadership, but the plurality. The Elizabeth Warrens on the Senate side are going to be empowered as well. So that the left is going to have more of a stranglehold on Washington than they do today in 23. What does that mean for Republicans in 24? And to your question about Trump, the agenda is going to be way out of he- over here when the American people are here. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the governance is making it worse. I mean, How does the woke left not realize that? Because they don't care about it. What they care about is getting power. They understand, the left understands a very basic thing. First you take power, then you create change. They have to take power first. Being the big fish in a small pond is how they take power. Then they'll worry about it. Because at the end of the day, what is American politics? It's it's two people you generally running for president. You get one of the two people nominated, you got a, a chance to take over the White House. Joe Biden's the best example of that. Um, and, and so from a left standpoint, they're playing the long game. And, uh, and they see the opportunity to take control of the Democratic Party in Washington in 23 uh, and and then worry about 24 next. Elizabeth Warren, you know, she's already running for president. Uh, and she's going to, you know, she'll change her strokes here and there. But first she's got to consolidate. She doesn't stand a chance. Well. Elizabeth Warren? You know uh, what? She's not marketable. Again, d- again, nominations are a different game. The, who, oh, nomination, yeah. But if she gets nominated, she's got a chance. I'm not saying but she hasn't will. that ship all sailed. The Elizabeth so. Warren, so. the Bernies, no. like we've been there, done that. 2016, let me, let me 2020, they're but, out. But, you're, but no, we haven't. Go, you're, I totally disagree with you. I totally disagree with you. 2016 was the. I mean, 2020 was the wrong time. Bernie Sanders. When we put the strategy together for 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 uh, Trump in 2016. Part of the vote that he got and we targeted, it was Sanders' vote in the primaries because they weren't leftist. Mm-hmm. They were drain the swamp type of people. Um, and what's going to happen is the rhetoric of 2024 is going to be revolutionary on the, from the west from the left standpoint. Um, and again, if they can consolidate and get. In the primaries, because in the prime, you get through the primaries. The left, the Democratic primaries are going to be primaries of the left, hmm. not the moderate Democrats, not the Joe Mansions, not the Joe Bidens. The Joe, I mean, Biden emerged for, for very uh, specific reasons. I always feared Joe Biden. I mean, he was the one. I mean, in fact, I did a couple of things. You might be the only person in America no, that no. fears Joe Biden. No, well, feared him in two thousand twenty. <laughs> Feared him in Why? Because I thought he could win. Why? Because American presidential politics, when you have an incumbent running for re-election, so it's not an open seat, it's, it's a matter of contrast. What you, you said it a minute ago. People were voting against Trump. You're right. Why were they voting against Trump? His personality. Correct. Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. Hide him in the, hide him in the basement. 
you know, you know, create this image of this, you know, soft, gentle person. Uh, that's the right image. Throw COVID on top of that. Throw expansion of voting on top of that. Throw uh, everything else. He gets a chance, and he and he pulled it off. Should he have won? No, but he did for that reason. So from the left standpoint, they think they're smarter than that, and yet Joe won. So we get control of the Democratic Party. We'll figure out how to win the general election against whoever. If it's Trump, we're going to go at him hard on Trump, and, and, and they'll make his personality. They'll try and make that the issue uh, and sneak by with softening Elizabeth Warren or softening uh, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, uh, Buttigieg, um, and then figure it out later after they win. You or, think a wild card like a rock, a celebrity, like if there's ever been a time to come in and win, like this is a good time to do it? One of these guys that's got a couple hundred million followers on Instagram, Twitter, they come and use that card. I, I think Elon Musk in the future is a candidate for president. He's not born here, though. Uh-huh. Born in South Well, that's South true, Africa. actually. You're right. That's That, that is the restriction. Yeah. You're right. He's, but but that he's going to be a major player. Yeah. He, well, he is now. But I mean, on Twitter. Um, yeah, but in our political system. I You're think. saying an outsider with a major, massive following right. and a ton of money. Like a Mark Cuban, will he run in, in 2024? Like, impossible. I mean, he'd like to be president. He saw, he saw Trump do it. He's a Democrat. Uh, you know, he's got a social image uh, that he's building. Uh, could he win the nomination? I don't think so. I think the problem on the Democratic side is it's going to be a leftist candidate for president. And, wow. Uh, and you think I'm we've a, come that – well, we're going to have a leftist candidate. Yeah, I, th I think that's what's going to emerge from the Democratic Party, especially if what happens in 22 – It's going to hurt them, though, I is what, Oh, yeah. They're going to get trounced if that's the if, direction they go. If, 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 and look at what they're doing. They're doubling down on moving left. I'm putting pressure on Biden right now yeah. on, on student debt. Soon, if he does student debt, I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean it's, it's really stupid from a political standpoint, but from the left standpoint – uh, you know they they like what it stands for, but if he does the student debt issue, what's going to happen? He's not going to get. He's not going to pump up turnout in the, in an off year cycle among young people. I mean, he may go from thirty seven to forty five percent voting for Democrats, but you know what the number one issue is for mm -hmm. for people in 19, eighteen to twenty nine right now? Inflation, the economy, and jobs. And so, do you think that? Forgiving the debt for a segment of the 18 to 29, because what happens to all the people who aren't going to college? Right. What happens to the people who are starting college next year? What about my debt? You know, these are the kinds of issues that you know affect who's going to turn out and how they're going to turn out. What about the guys who paid for their debt? Yeah, like me. I paid off my okay, debt. Okay, yeah, there you go. I, I mean, the point is the left doesn't care. That's a big. That's a big vote. Uh, uh, if you're able to get, you know, all these folks' college debt to be forgiven, you know what loyalty you'll get from them because that that keeps a lot of people. But that, they're not even a majority of the segment of the eighteen to twenty. Not at all. They're not. And, no. And what what's going to happen? What does it do to inflation? Which is the number one issue for that voter block? Well, actually, for every voter block, but for that voter block, you know, it's going to make it worse. And so all of a sudden now, you're. You're rewarding people, who, a small segment who got college debt, and you're punishing the, everyone in that time in, in the country with inflation, which is the number one issue. The, but the left only cares about where they're going to be in uh, January of 2023. Are you and Trump in communication right now? You guys talking? Uh, I'm not going to get into that kind of conversation. Only, only reason I ask the question is because if if he does go 2020. Three, okay, twenty twenty four, and he runs. Um, who's he going to put on his campaign? Who's he going to bring in? Who's out there that he can bring in to help him out? There's not. Uh, I don't think he'll have any trouble hiring people. I, I, I mean, I, I, I saw Thiel is making a decision to you know Thiel is uh, Peter Thiel. That's a pretty big name to have there, but that's a different role. That's more well, on the truth yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I, th I don't think Trump will have any trouble putting together a campaign if he decides to run, um, and. <laughs> It'll be a campaign that's more pro-Trump. I mean, in the sense that uh, you know, it, it, tr one of Trump's biggest problems when he first became president, when he was first elected, is he didn't have a bench. He didn't have people to put into the government. Um, you know, he, he had he, Trump didn't know anybody in Washington when he ran for president. I mean, I mean, 
I tell the story in the book. I mean, when I got involved, normally when you get involved in a campaign, after, you're somewhere in the middle of the process, and you have a specific role, you have to come in, you have to clean out some stuff, move people aside, bring your own people in. I had none of that problem because there was nobody to move out. <laughs> there was no there there. Trump was the campaign. He was the candidate. He was the pollster. He was the communication director. He was the uh, the speech writer. He, he was he was the uh, adv- advance guy. I mean, he you know I mean, and there were a couple of people who were the golfers, not golfers, hope picks, assistants to do things. Hope was very important for Trump because I think so. Hope yeah. Hope he, he was a very organized person. She understood Trump. And so she could get done what Trump asked her to do efficiently and quickly, which is why he loved her. Um, but I'm talking about, but but Trump came up with the strategy of hope do this or put this tweet out, whatever. He was the strategist of the campaign and the and the media guy as well. What was your role? Well, well, when I came in, I first came in to help because of that the, that kind of campaign structure. The the nomination process is. A multiple process, a multifaceted process. You have to win the primaries, but you have to win the delegates, and they're not connected. They there's there's a dotted line connection, but for example, Cruz understood all the rules of the Republican Party and the nominating process, and so the feeling was tr- Trump's strategy was I'm one of 16 people. I can get nominated by just building my pluralities after each election. Cruz's strategy was there are 16 people against Trump. And so the, the, the opportunity to elect delegates that are not, autom- that are not, are not automatically elected it creates an opportunity to have a convention floor of non-Trump people. Meaning, let's say, and every state was different, but let's say uh, you know, in, in Vir- Virginia elects well, yeah, elects their delegates at a convention, but they have a primary, and you, there's uh, some some the allocations are by CD and by at large. But the conventions elect the delegates. So let's say I've won. I don't. Remember, I think Virginia has 51 delegates, uh, but I've won 37 delegates based on the on the law. But I don't control the convention. I could have 10 delegates on the floor. Ten delegates on the floor, if there's a majority of people who are not for Trump on the floor, even though Trump's got 40 percent, 45 percent of the convention, they can vote. They have to vote for Trump based on, again, the states, the first ballot. But they can vote against Trump on rules, on uh, on freeing up delegates and undercutting state laws, on convention uh, officers, on the platform. And then on the second ballot, if they keep it from happening on the first ballot, the, the ones who were voting for Trump, in many cases, are freed to do whatever they want. And if they're not Trump people, but they were just Trump Trump uh, uh, bodies, or not Trump bodies, the, the nomination is at risk, which was the Cruz strategy. That was Cruz's strategy. He had people who understood convention politics very well and party rules very well. So Trump sees himself all of a sudden winning primaries and then subsequent state conventions electing Cruz delegates who have to vote for Trump for the first ballot, but only for Trump on, on the ballot question. And he's saying, this is fixed. It's, 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 uh, I'm, being, I'm being robbed. The party is cheating me. Well, the party wasn't cheating him. Uh, he just didn't have a structure that was paying attention to the rules. So that way he was running the campaign, he came into a state, he wins the state, he then moves. There's no that party. almost cost him by the that, way. Well, that's why he brought yeah. me in. Yeah. That's why he brought me in because when he moved, there was nobody left in the state. Well, guess what? Cruz people were going in after the primaries, uh, and, and they were electing the bodies to, to be at the convention. And so, Trump finally had a meeting with Priebus and to complain that the party is screwing me, and Priebus said to him, "No, Donald, you just don't understand the rules. You just don't understand the rules." I remember that and. Time, yeah. and so Trump turned to Lewandowski, who was sitting with him there, and said, did you know this, Corey? Corey said, no, because no. Corey had never done anything like this. He didn't understand the rules. And so Trump's realizing, I'm winning, but I'm not winning. And that's my expertise. 
among other things. And that's why I was brought in. What happened to Roger Stone? What happened? He seems like he's like uh, turning more and more against. Uh, this is your former business partner. What's going on with him and Trump? Oh, they, they just have a love. I mean, they're like big brother, little brother. I mean, they, going back to the 1980s, I mean, Rogers, Trump became president because of Roger Stone. Not in the sense that Roger elected St- uh, uh, Trump, but Roger was the one who set in Trump's mind, you can be president. Mm. And when Trump started to finally look at Washington, because he, again, the only time, he never, when I brought him to Washington in, in the spring of 2016, he didn't know it. Basically, didn't know anybody unless they had come to New York to ask him for money, and he, he knew just as many on the Democratic side as on the Republican yeah, side. Which he said, he very vocal. right, right. And so, so nobody knew Trump, but Roger knew Trump, and and Roger got got Trump to start paying attention to politics in like 1983 and 84, and then and I go into this in detail as well. Then Ross Perot ran for president mm-hmm. in in '92. Uh, and Trump looked at the Perot thing and said, well, it's an interesting phenomenon. And then, of course, Ross, Ross Perot loses. But Trump says, I'm smarter than these guys. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wouldn't think did all these stupid things. He could have been president. And there was a chance that at the time point that Perot was leading uh, or close to leading in the, in the three-party race. Nineteen twenty one percent, you know, he was hovering. Right, but but Bush yeah. was at thirty six right. and Clinton was about thirty five, thirty six, and mm-hmm. there was a lot of undecided. Um you know, horse race. It was a three it was Ross legitimate. Perot was Clinton's best campaign manager. Well he was in the <laughs> end he was yeah. in the end, yeah. but Trump's point was Ross Perot could have been elected. Yeah. Yeah. But he wasn't smart enough and he wasn't ready enough. And he wasn't tall enough. And he wasn't tall enough. Well, that's, that's another theory of Rogers, the guy the guy with the yeah. big head and the height wins. Uh uh, but uh, dude. but um, but Roger was sort of the adrenaline to that mm-hmm. to, with Trump. Um, you said big brother, little brother. You're comparing Roger Stone as the big brother to Trump being the little brother. Uh, no, I think it's changed. Okay. <laughs> but at the time, it, at the time, Roger was the expert, and Trump was the was trying to learn. Trump never mm-hmm. looked at himself as a little brother. But the point is. Yeah. They would fight like that. I mean, they loved each other. They hated each other. And Stone was your full-on business partner. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. For, for the in the in the eighties, um, when we sold the firm in ninety two, uh, I left the firm after my lockup, and uh, Roger went off in a different direction too. Did you get a Nixon tattoo like him? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although Nixon used to, Roger would. My office was Nixon's office when he came to Washington because I had the Got big it. office, and uh, Roger convinced Nixon. Paul, do you have any tattoos? I have no tattoos. If you had to get a tattoo of a president, if you had to, who would it be? George Washington. Boom, right there. there you and you're back? Father of the country. There you go. Okay. So. Not Trump? I would never get a tattoo, <laughs> but if I had to have a symbol of something, I'd have the father of our country on my Fair back. Fair enough. Um, and then maybe Abraham Lincoln after that. Um, but, uh, but Trump and Roger, you know, have their falling outs. But Trump has never... Oh, Trump, Roger's always been there somewhere in, in Trump's world. Um, and their fallouts are more just because they're both media people, media stories, and, but not really behind-the-scenes realities. Uh, uh, Tyler, do you have that story about voting? I'm curious to know, get the final thoughts before we wrap up. The voting story that they want to get 100% of people to vote if you don't, it's a $20 fine. Did you hear about that or no? What's that? That they're trying to legislate where... A hundred percent of people who are able to vote have to vote, or else there's going to be a twenty dollar fine. Have you heard any of this? I have, but that is, that's uh, who's who's they. Uh, do, do you have this, uh, Tyler? Is this a Minneapolis? Let me tell you, if a Republican offered that, they'd be called racist because who who's going to suffer from that? The blacks and the minority communities. If there's a twenty dollar mm-hmm. you know poll tax penalty. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a crazy idea. Can you find it or no? Yeah, give me one. Okay, you look for it. I'm going to go to the Kevin McCarthy story. Tucker Carlson said, uh, declares Kevin McCarthy a puppet of the Democratic Party who shouldn't be speaker. Sounds like an MSNBC contributor. Carlson pointed uh, to an expert excerpt in a forthcoming book. This will not pass by New York Times reporters Alexander Burns and Jonathan Martin four days after the January 6th insurrection. Capital Ride, they quote McCarthy as musing, allowed whether Twitter would ban uh, incendiary accounts that have tweeted favorably 
about the incident. He was participating in a meeting of the House of GOP leadership at the time. Congressman Kevin McCarthy of California told his close friends Liz Cheney that he hoped the social media companies would censor more conservative Republicans in Congress, he stated. Donald Trump, the sitting president, had already been silenced by those companies, but McCarthy wanted the tech oligarchs to do more and force disobedient lawmakers off the Internet. What are your thoughts on Kevin McCarthy? I mean, there's a lot of emotion goes into the, that time frame and what people were saying. I don't know what McCarthy said. I've heard the tape as well, but I don't know the context. Do I think Trump and McCarthy have settled the, whatever the differences are? Yeah, I do. I mean, this the story is out today, mm-hmm. but the but the this this, came, this leaked out a while ago, and uh, and I've watched what McCarthy has said since that time. I've watched what Trump has not said since that time. And it appears to me that they've made their peace on it. Can I ask him a good question? Sure. So Paul Manafort, he's in the house. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I didn't just realize that. But what I'm learning about you is uh, there's a lot more to you prior to than when everyone really full on knew your name in 2016. Okay. So I'm looking at your essentially your Wikipedia page right here. Uh, my question to you is two part question is number one, how important is your reputation to you? My reputation is important to me. I'm writing the book to sort of at yeah. least have an historical record. Yeah. I mean, I realized in the in the moment in 2017 and 18, it, there was a tsunami against me. And yeah. There was no way me trying to put out anything was possible. Plus, once I got indicted, they put a gag order on me. Right. So that uh, I couldn't say a thing, even though all the stories continued to leak and uh, and, and characterize me. So your reputation is important to you, is what I'm establishing. So it says here in the book, it says, um, it's no exaggeration that everything most Americans think they know about Paul Manafort is false. So I'm looking at, again, your Wikipedia here. Um, essentially, nothing is black and white. A lot of gray. So, you know, essentially there's words at the beginning, power broker, political advocate, political consultant, political expert, right? And then you kind of keep reading down and then it says criminal, tax fraudster, money launderer, scandal. So you have all these things, you know, for and against you. So my essential question is, who actually is Paul Manafort? Paul Manafort is an American who has spent his life trying to improve the political system and uh, bring democracy to countries around the world. Paul Manafort has always been somebody who works with the United States government's interest overseas. That includes whether they're Republicans or Democrats in Washington, uh, because overseas, uh, I grew up with, there's, you know, f- politics stops at the American border. And, uh, and I spent my life doing that. Uh, the Paul Manafort of 2017, 18 is not Paul Manafort. It's a lie. It was part of a social media uh, uh, orchestration to define me so that uh, I, I could, and I get into this in the book, so that I would feel the pressure and give in to the system and give them up Donald Trump, which I wouldn't do. One, because there was nothing to give up, but two, because uh, uh, you know I wasn't going to lie. And, and because I wouldn't lie, and because I wouldn't uh, uh, concede to what was uh, I considered to be a, a cabal against me, the, uh, I went to jail, and I suffered, and the parts of that Wikipedia that you're reading were written by people who were, some of whom were paid to stand outside the courtroom holding signs, traitor, go back to Russia, pro-Putin, things that I spent my whole life in politics fighting mm-hmm. was now being, being used to define me when I couldn't speak back. In the book, uh, I get to speak back. It's coming out in August. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be willing to come back here and talk to you with more of the details of it when that com- when it does come out because I'm not afraid of talking about my life. I'm not afraid. My life is something that I'm proud of, and, uh, and it, my book talks about why that is. So my father became a Republican on a matter of principle, the only Republican in his family. He was uh, he was elected as the working man's mayor. It was a blue collar town. Three New, times. New Britain was a blue collar town. Yeah. You know, you know, Stanley Works had their first. That's where their headquarters still is. Uh, F- Fafner ball bearings. Uh, all these uh, is an ethnic melting pot. You know, Irish, Italian, Ukrainians, Armenians. Uh, you know, and I grew up where you, know, you you lived by your you played sports. You went to school, you lived by your brains, and you chose your careers by your interests. And that's the American dream. And I lived it. My father 
Uh, my family company is a good example of that, uh, which I chose not to get involved in in the end. But my grandfather in 1919, at 10 years old, came over to, to from Italy, uh, sent over by himself uh, to be picked up in New York. And he created in 19, I mean, before 1919, but in 1919 he created with one pickaxe and a shovel uh, a demolition company that would, with one employee, they went and they would take down buildings and the salvage was what they made their money on. Uh, we're in the fifth generation of the family business now. It's one of the largest uh, uh, nuclear uh, nuclear plant uh, decom, uh, uh, decom, well, I guess, well, it's not demolishing, but to, to deconstruct it uh, worldwide. Uh, it's it, and uh, it's it's the, I think the biggest family owned business in Connecticut now. Um, they live the American dream too. Each generation that uh, of, of my family, and and one of the reasons I felt Donald Trump could win in 2016 is my cousins are not are not political. They're businessmen, and many of them still haven't gone to college. I mean, they, they're they're the fifth generation is, but. Uh, in the fourth generation, but they they were the fabric of our country, and they were all for Donald Trump, and they were calling me saying, "What do you know about Donald Trump?" Mm-hmm. They never called me in my political career, asked me about a candidate running for president. It was a signal to me what what I already felt, but it was confirmation that Trump was onto something uh, that when you got out of Washington uh, was existed in the country. Ronald Reagan understood the United States very well. He understood it because. When he was the spokesman for GE and the and their weekly television program, uh, he would travel to all the GE plants around the country, which were not in the main the capital. He was getting paid, paid a million to do that. Eventually, they fired him because they said you're talking too much about America. But the point is, he was not going to the capitals yeah. because the plants were in the secondary cities and and suburbs. But he got to understand the country, and the reason he was such a, and I some of my treasured moments is when. When I traveled with him, the reason he was so confident in what he was talking about was because what he had learned about the American people. Powerful. Donald Trump was the same way. Donald Trump, through The Apprentice, different, but the same kind of connections, made those connections with the American people. And, and I saw it firsthand when I would travel with Trump, just like I saw it firsthand with Reagan. Well, that's who I am. I'm that, kind of that person. And I came to Washington to help Re- and to make a career on representing that, mo- that, that uh, and to try and protect it. That's not in the Wikipedia because the Wikipedia is a political mm-hmm. document that's written by the Twitter types who yeah. spent all the time trying to define I'll it. I'll admit, I wasn't a fan of Paul Manafort in 2016, 2017. Straight up. Yeah. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm now officially a fan. Well, thank you very much. I, I wouldn't have expected you to be, but I'm glad you are now. <laughs> Paul, uh, are you a movie guy? I am. Favorite movie of all time. I'm, I'm assuming it's number two. Is it Godfather 2 or no? <laughs> you know, you want to know my favorite movie of all time? What's Godfather that? is up in the top five, but there's a, there's a movie that I really like a lot. It's a silly movie. It's called Michael. And Michael is, in the movie, John Travolta is an angel who comes Incredible down. Incredible movie. Yeah. yeah. And it's a, but it's a movie about hope yeah. and about uh, dreams. Crazy. And that's my, that is my favorite I would never movie. never guess you're going to say Michael. I mean, most people don't even know the movie Michael. They probably don't, but to me, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 uh, that is my favorite movie of all time. Why did you think Godfather too? No, first of all, Italian, you know, I mean, no, it's, it's in not, the top it's, five. It's, it's, <laughs> first of all, you ha- if, if you have any interest of politics, yeah, you, you you have to you, you you have to because it's all power plays. That's all it is. Yeah. And if to be able to survive the power plays of the, like what you're doing in there, that's not easy. Especially for four decades, that's a pretty hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. But it, I'm going to compliment you. Yeah. I would not expect of you to know Michael. So. It's a great movie. It's a yeah, great it's movie. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm g- Early great 90s. movie. But, but do you yeah. think they'll ever change the laws for a guy like Elon Musk to be able to run like a law to yeah. say they're not going to change? That's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last because one, if I'm, so, it opens up a PBD. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a king maker. I want to. I want to help the guy get there. Speed run. I'll give you a name. Give me one word that comes to your mind. Steve Bannon. Uh, <laughs> uh, Idiot. Okay, Corey uh, Lewandowski. Uh, small man. Hope Hicks. Good person. Roger Stone. Good friend. Kellyanne Conway. Good friend. Mike Pence. Uh, a, a very good vice president. DeSantis. Uh, the potential future. Mueller. 
uh, a man who's passed to, well, one word uh, not a good person it's just about one word but uh, Mueller was used uh, and uh, in my book I talk about my experience with him uh, I, I was not impressed with him Hillary Clinton fake Biden uh, over beyond his time the FBI uh I don't want to define all of the FBI, but people who abuse their power. Avenatti. Uh, Charlotte. Cohen, Michael Cohen. Uh, over his head. Podesta. Which one? Uh, the, the one you worked with. Good guy. Okay. Uh, John Durham. Uh, Hope. Last but not least, Donald Trump. Uh, a man who made a difference. Fantastic. Awesome. It's been a blast having you on. Seriously, this was great. Thank you so much yeah. for coming out. I'm looking forward to having you back on when the book comes out. Uh, Tyler, put the link below for the link of the book. I'll give you the final thoughts. Any final thoughts you want to share with the audience before we wrap up? Well, I mean, I mean, I appreciate this opportunity today. Uh, in this expanded format allowed me the opportunity to get into context, which I couldn't. And I would just like the American people to pay attention to what I say, not what other people say about me. Fair enough. When's the book coming out? August sixteenth. August sixteenth. But it's on. It's pre sales now. Yeah, we're gonna put the link below in chat box and the description. All of it for people to get it, uh, folks. We are not doing a podcast till next Tuesday, I believe. Do we have Tuesday? No, uh, Monday we have William Roger Reeves, <clears throat> the uh, the pilot for Escobar. Very interesting. Drug runner. Yep. William Roger Reeves on Monday. Yep. Fantastic, folks. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Kind of goes. Time goes. So weird how this thing works. Victoria, would you mind?